from the beginning of time. This has been Mankind's Dream. To explore the wonders of nature in all its magnificence. To experience the treasure of life with all its possibilities. To unravel the mysteries of time with all its promise. As the pace of life all around us quickens, science is on the verge of making mankind's dream of having more time a reality. A dream of harnessing time, capturing time, expanding time. Enough time to explore, to discover, to understand, to experience a long and fruitful life. The ancient Egyptians believed that their spirit in the afterlife could eat, play, and enjoy all the things they had on earth. For 25 centuries, Tibetan monks harbored the secrets to remarkable rejuvenation in the Eye of Revelation. Polynesian tradition located their fountain of perpetual youth in Hawaii. More than 500 years ago, Ponce de Leon sought the fabled fountain of youth throughout the Americas. The promise of more time has fascinated man from the beginning, always beckoning. If we live 10 more years, that's good. If we live 20 more years, that's pretty good. 30 more years, oh, it's getting sketchy. 40, 50, okay. If you live 54 years, think of all the things that you could do within those 50 years. You could see your children graduating from college. You could see your children being married. And then you could see their children. You could see your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. More time for love. I want more time to have more of the same and all the things, all the experiences, all the adventures, all the passions, all the intimacies, all the closenesses with family that I can't possibly get into a day, a week, a month, a year, a normal lifespan. More time to experience life to the fullest. Well, I want to enjoy life. I enjoy life now. I have no desire uh, to stop living. The family, the friends, and the quality of life uh, keeps uh, improving. Life becomes uh, a greater experience as we uh, grow older and uh, understand it better. More time to see what the future will bring. I would really love to get a chance to see the stars one day and, and maybe do some intergalactic travel instead of just uh, international travel. I think we have a tremendous instinct for survival. I think it was best stated, at least in printed word, the longest ago by Benjamin Franklin, who very clearly stated that he wished, instead of an ordinary death, to be placed in a cask of Madeira wine with some good friends to be revived by the warm sun of his country a hundred years hence. But he said, alas, I fear we are too close to the infancy of science to have that happen. Well, we're not 200 and some odd years later too close to the infancy. In fact, we are approaching uh, the nascency, uh, the nascence of this idea being very possible. So I think it's within human beings to want to know what might happen in the future. But it would be more than two centuries before science would catch up to Franklin's wish. In 1964, physics teacher Robert Edinger published The Prospect of Immortality, detailing the prospect of freezing a human until medical science advanced enough to restore the person to good health. Man's dream of suspending life was on the verge of reality, and it was called cryonics. Myself and a couple of others were involved with uh, cryogenics, uh, cryonic, cryogenics at the time, which is making uh, vehicles to store liquid nitrogen, liquid hydrogen, oxygen. And we had a uh, very uh, interesting experience uh, working with the NASA uh, S4V Saturn upper stage that took the, put the Apollo astronauts on the moon by doing a lot of cryogenic testing with, with vessels and valves and this sort of thing. From that data, from that knowledge, we produced about 1,000 cryocapsules a year. So we designed what we felt was the ultimate cryocapsule. It's super insulation, high vacuum, uh, access ports using the latest technology for sealing and with bellows for expansion and instrumentation. And we had it fabricated here in Phoenix. 
just three short years after Edinger's book in January of 1967, Ted Craver and his colleagues got their chance to make history. About a year later is when we got the word from California that Dr. Bedford had died and uh, his, uh, his family wanted him frozen and uh, it was brought in, oh, I think about late afternoon and we had the capsule ready and uh, we started the procedure and we had, uh, it took until about three in the morning, three or four in the morning before we could finally uh, get Dr. Bedford, uh, we'd been pre-frozen, into the capsule, all the instrumentation hooked up and all the um, uh, insulation put around the, the head of it and put the outer head on and then eventually started drawing a vacuum. And then we uh, uh, put the liquid nitrogen in and we could watch the temperature dropping very rapidly and it seemed to be pretty well frozen, deeply frozen by the, uh, by the next day. This new avenue of scientific exploration called cryonics not only captured the imagination of scientific men like Ted Craver, but of Hollywood as well. So while the science of cryonics was still a neophyte, the movies were already giving us visions of what could be ahead. Could science really discover the way to suspend time? You will be placed in cryostasis for the duration of your sentence. Could we travel hundreds of light years away to the edge of the galaxy and awaken when we arrived? Even before Edinger's vision in the 1960s, science and technology were already extending our lifespans. Since Henry Ford introduced his first Model T, the average American lifespan has increased by 50%. In the early 1900s, no one dreamed of a cure for polio, let alone life-extending heart transplants, life-giving in vitro fertilization, or life-changing stem cell research. And with each new scientific and medical advancement, we understand more about the true nature of our biology, the subtleties between life and death. What was considered dead 50 years ago is no longer valid today. CPR and defibrillators revive thousands of legally dead people each year effortlessly. Organ transplants and open heart surgery are routine and highly successful at bringing new life to the otherwise terminally ill patient. And we know from the miraculous stories of children who have been brought back to life after drowning in icy lakes or rivers, that cold staved off death. Well, people are beginning to reassess what they mean by death, and it's, it's long, this has long been overdue because we've known that you can preserve cells and even organisms like tardigrade, a little water bear animal, for a hundred years without any metabolism at all. So we know that metabolism, the machinery of life, doesn't have to be active for life to be there in some kind of form. So our usual definition of life, which is the metabolic processes and the chemistry and all those things, that's not really life. Life is the information with the ability to store cells in liquid nitrogen for as long as you want, which we do routinely now, and embryos, human embryos as well, um, we should be thinking about the fact that life is, is the information and that it is potentially as permanent as you'd like it to be. So if death is not simply the moment when our heart stops, then when does it occur? We have this legal concept called clinical death, where one is pronounced dead, but there's no actual you know, black and white biological change that happens simultaneously with going from a state of being um, clinically dead, clinically allowed to clinically dead, or that really matters if your heart has stopped. And it's some time from then before um, things start going really wrong, especially if you get cooled down really quickly as soon as your heart has stopped. Um, so. Restoring someone who's been well cryopreserved to a uh, functional state, a biologically functional state, is simply a natural extension of restoring someone who is still alive but very frail and suffering advanced aspects of aging, whether it's cancer or atherosclerosis or whatever, again, then to a youthful state. It's not even just theoretically possible in the same way that um, traveling at half the speed of light is theoretically possible. It's a perfectly reasonable natural extension of straightforward biotechnology. Cryonics is the next logical step for significantly extending life. I think cryonics 
is going to one day possibly provide that ultimate dream come true. It will radically transform society. The way we think about life and death today will be obsolete. I think we're going to have to develop a whole new paradigm on what uh, life is, what death is, and what constitutes an acceptable lifespan. Or even if there is such a thing as a acceptable lifespan, or is an unlimited lifespan going to become the norm? Optimally, cryonics captures biological life at the moment medical science pronounces death, but before the biological functions begin to deteriorate. Death is not an event. It is a process. And at the moment of legal pronouncement, you are still very much biologically alive. And if we can uh, access your body at the time of pronouncement, and put you into biostasis immediately, then we have essentially stopped your biological clock and we're able to preserve you in that biologically viable state for an indefinite period of time. At which point, at some point in time in the future, uh, it may be possible to uh, revive you from biostasis and cure whatever um, it was, disease, uh, uh, physical uh, trauma that caused your death and restore you to good health. This is the world's leader in cryonics and cryonics research and technology, the Alcor Life Extension Foundation in Scottsdale, Arizona. Alcor was founded in 1972 in Fulton, California for the purposes of cryonic suspension. Uh, after a number of years, uh, we relocated our facility from Fulton to Riverside, California. And after about 10 years in that location, because we outgrew it and because of the uh, concern that we had uh, with earthquakes, uh, we decided to relocate to Scottsdale, Arizona. From its quiet beginnings in the 70s, today Alcor has over 700 members around the globe including world-renowned scientists, physicians, scholars, and business leaders. In this state-of-the-art operating room in Scottsdale, Arizona, the intricate work of cryonics is routinely performed. The science of cryonics is a series of meticulous and exacting procedures to ensure that the patient has the best possible chance to be revitalized in the future. There are three basic steps. First, the stabilization. Next, the introduction of cryoprotectants. And the third step is the final cool down to sub-zero temperatures. Under ideal circumstances, it starts within an instant of a physician pronouncing legal death. We deploy a team of specially trained technicians, uh, some paramedics, some EMTs, some cryonicists, and they take a kit that has stabilization equipment, quite extensive stabilization equipment. Uh, this equipment includes a series of medications that are injected after pronouncement. In the first part of the procedure when the person just after their heart is stopped, um, the, the main problem is trying to get them cold as fast as possible. And uh, the idea is to remove as much of the temperature, uh, as much of the heat as you can and cool them as rapidly as possible because the damage that happens is a function of temperature. So. Uh, if you go all the way down to the temperature of ice, the damage is happening only at 1 18th as fast as at normal body temperature. And at that point, we perform a blood washout. We wash out their blood and replace it with an organ preservation solution. Specially developed solutions called cryoprotectants are carefully infused. Now, cryoprotection is the step of the procedure that is probably the most critical. It is the one that prepares the tissues for the lower temperatures and reduces the damage that occurs when you freeze tissue. Right now, taking tissue down to, to minus 196 degrees Celsius causes all tissue to freeze. There is damage. And the purpose of the cryoprotection is to reduce the damage to a minimal form. The final and longest step is a carefully controlled and monitored cool down. We cool the patient under controlled circumstances at the rate of one degree Celsius per hour, all the way down to liquid nitrogen. 
And during this time, there's, there's no observation that can be done directly of the individual because the temperature changes, they're very sensitive to temperature changes. So we do have computer monitoring of the whole system as well as control of the cooling curve itself. So once they're cooled, and they're minus 196. Uh, it's a simple matter of transferring them to a long-term storage stewer, a container, very similar to a giant thermos bottle. Uh, basically, it requires no electricity, uh, no support of any kind aside from the occasional topping up with liquid nitrogen. And once there, we've got time. We've got time because a person can be maintained at that temperature with virtually no degradation of the tissue indefinitely. 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Nearly 70 patients are carefully maintained in the Alcor patient care bay, waiting for science and technology to find the solutions that will restore them to good health. The science and technology of extending life tomorrow is happening today. Our scientific goals are to achieve re reversible suspended animation. Uh, to be able to, to place our patients into biostasis without cellular disruption and to be able to bring our patients down to a temperature that is sufficient to preserve them for a extended period of time without causing damage to them through the cryopreservation process itself. In Southern California, 21st century medicine is breaking new ground in the world of cryobiology. At 21st century medicine, we do research on low temperature preservation of tissues and organs for medical applications, especially transplantation and pharmaceutical research. We currently have federally funded projects for preservation of kidneys, hearts, corneas, and also do research on preservation of tissue slices for pharmaceutical research. Here, their work focuses on the full circle of preserving organs in deep coal and then recovering them with minimal damage. When we prepare an organ for cryopreservation, we begin by perfusing it with a solution that closely resembles the liquid part of blood. And then we begin slowly increasing the concentration of cryoprotectants over a period of a couple of hours. And then at that time, the, the organ is ready for deep cooling. We then cool the organ as rapidly as we can, uh, and we cool to a temperature of approximately minus 130 degrees C, ideally. And then we can store for as long as we want at that temperature. Uh, we would then um, carefully rewarm it and uh, connect it back up to an organ perfusion machine that then, in a careful, gradual process, uh, unloads the cryoprotectants over a period of several hours, at which point it will be ready to be transplanted. The implications of this work are far-reaching. Each year, more than 16,000 people die because they need an organ transplant, and there is none available. My goal is to have us be very successful at preserving organs by conventional methods and by cryopreservation. And I believe that the outcome of this will be that tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, if not millions of patients will benefit and may even survive as a result of the efforts that we're doing here at, in this company. Well, right now, as everyone knows, we're faced in the United States with a uh, rapidly aging population that is going to have tremendous medical needs in coming decades. And a lot of those needs can be addressed by transplantation and tissue replacement, uh, especially of bioengineered tissues. And uh, the ability to uh, inventory those tissues using uh, good preservation methods will be vital to treating uh, an aging population. Of paramount importance to the success of cryobiology is the ability to cool to super low temperatures without damage to cells. Normal freezing causes water to damage surrounding cells. This has a devastating effect since our bodies are 60% water. Enter a process called vitrification. Vitrification is a process where we replace uh, so much water inside cells and tissues with agents called cryoprotectants that we can cool the tissue or organs to a very low temperature, even as cold as liquid nitrogen, without forming any ice inside them. And in this process, once we 
become colder than about minus 120 degrees Celsius, the tissue becomes essentially solid like a glass. This photograph shows two rabbit kidneys at a temperature of minus 140 degrees Celsius. The kidney on the left was frozen and it's essentially turned into a, uh, an ice ball, severely damaged by ice, whereas the kidney on the right was protected by chemicals that caused it to vitrify rather than freeze. And it shows no signs of ice damage whatsoever. As research gets closer and closer to perfecting cryoprotectants, the odds of successfully reversing the process get better. Until that time, what about damage that results from imperfect methods, especially for those who were cryopreserved before the advent of today's new cryoprotectants? Disease and ill health are caused largely by damage at the molecular and the cellular level. Today's surgical tools are simply too big to deal with that kind of damage. In the future, with nanotechnology, we'll have medical tools and medical instruments that are molecular in their size and in their precision. And these tools will be able to deal directly with the fundamental causes of damage and ill health. We'll be able to cure and heal in cases that today would be considered hopeless. Nanotechnology is the revolutionary concept of molecular-sized machines. Machines so tiny they could be introduced into a person. From the imaginations of artists around the world, we are able to see how nanorobots and nanomachines yet to be developed could solve any number of problems. From repairing aging cells to hunting down cancer. So if you had medical nano devices small enough that they could literally circulate through the body and literally enter individual cells, these small devices with small onboard computers could check for several different conditions. They could check the concentration of several different chemicals in the red blood cell. They could check the location. Obviously, if you're looking at liver cancer, you don't have to worry about tissue that's in your big toe. So location information could be used, chemical concentration information could be used so that the medical nano device would be able to identify the cell as either normal or cancerous. And if it was cancerous, then it could go ahead and use a variety of techniques to remove that cell, to eliminate that cell from the body. At prestigious research facilities like Stanford, Caltech, and MIT, advances in medical nanotechnology are being made. With each new advancement, the ability to revitalize patients in cryonic suspension moves one step closer to reality. Everyone always wants to know how long it will be before these technologies are available. And the correct scientific answer is, I don't know. Having said that, though, I can look at the trends in computer hardware, where every year we are building smaller, more precise, finer structures. And if you extrapolate those trend lines out, you find that within a few decades, we'll have to develop some sort of nanotechnology to keep the computer hardware revolution on track. And the technologies we develop that will let us build these molecular structures for electronic and computer devices should be applicable to let us build a whole range of other molecular structures. So, I think a few decades in order to have the molecular machines, the molecular devices that we'll be using in nanomedicine. The promise of cryonics, vitrification, and nanotechnology is enormous. But these leading edge sciences and technologies are not without their challenges, including sorting scientific facts from popular and wide held fiction. The challenge is, is having the public understand the long-term implications and benefits to humankind of cryogenics, vitrification, and cryopreservation. Uh, right now, I think they get that Hollywood view of Ricardo Montalban in Star Trek coming out of a glass encased uh, facility, uh, fully clothed, having been preserved for 200 years, and he starts walking and talking, or worse. They look at Austin Powers coming out of a vitrification or cryogenic preservation 
and, and of course that's, that's probably the worst side of it. But, but the fact of the matter is we need to explain to them and educate to them the long-term value of the scientific study of cryogenics, nanotechnology, and vitrification, and the other related sciences, and what it can mean long-term to humankind. In any discussion of death and dying, the questions of God and religion often arise. Uh, I think the biggest myth about cryonics is that we're trying to play God, that we are tampering with the natural forces of life. Um, no, we're not trying to play God, and many of us have a belief in a supreme being. Um, that second part of it is a little more intriguing, that we're, uh, we're tampering with nature. Of course we are. That's what science does. It attempts to overcome those forces of nature that have been detrimental to the human species. Um, and we're proud of that. But are we playing God? Do we choose who shall live and who shall die? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And the philosophical questions abound. At each juncture of exponential advancement in science and technology, each time we push forward the boundaries of man's reach, it is inevitable that we take a good, hard look at what it means. This is radically new. This is radically different from what people have practiced for thousands of years. There is a lot of apprehension about where we're going with this technology, just like there's a lot of apprehension about where scientists are going with stem cell research, uh, with therapeutic cloning, uh, with cellular regeneration. These are all emerging sciences that are not going to stop just because it makes people queasy. Uh, these things are going to happen and we need as a society to embrace these technologies. It is in our nature to explore, to seek, to question, both scientifically and philosophically. And we will continue to question, to challenge the thresholds of science, to dream of tomorrow. You know, I lost my mother when I was 20 and she was 49 and I have to tell you, there's so many parts of my life that she didn't get to experience. I want to experience all of those times with my children and my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren. And I don't know what's gonna happen to me. You never know. My mother was a healthy person and then one day she was sick and she was gone. And that could happen to me. I would love the opportunity to suspend my life, to not suffer through illness and pain and then to be reanimated at a time when I could be a healthy person again and live a healthy life. To dream of the unknown, unbounded, limitless. If you would like to order a copy of this program, visit us on our website or call this number.